Welcome to React Roundup. I'm Jack Harrington, and with me today is Paige Niederinghaus. Hey, everybody. And TJ Van Toll. Hey, everyone. Now, we don't have a guest today, but we do have a panelist episode, and we are going to talk about keeping your React application up to date. I remember working my tail off to become a senior developer. I read every book I could get my hands on. I went to any conference I could and watched the videos about the things that I thought I needed to learn. And eventually, I got that senior developer job. And then I realized that the rest of my career looked just like where I was now. I mean, where was the rush I got from learning? What was I supposed to do to keep growing? And then I found it. I got the chance to mentor some developers. I started a podcast and helped many more developers. I did screencasts and helped even more developers. I kind of became a dev hero. And now I want to help you become one too. And if you're looking forward to something more than doing the same thing at a different job three years from now, then join the Dev Heroes Accelerator. I'll walk you through the process of building and growing a following and finding people that you can uniquely help as you build the next stage of your career. You can learn more at devheroesaccelerator.com. So Paige, why don't you kick us off with some ideas that you've been thinking about? Well, that's a really interesting topic. And I think that it doesn't get as much play as it should, because that is the reality for a lot of developers. We come on to teams where applications usually exist. And if we're lucky, it's in a newer framework like React, like Vue, like Angular. If you're unlucky, it's still using jQuery or Backbone, which I feel for you. <laughs> <laughs> but that is, it's just something that happens a lot, especially with very, very large enterprises with long running applications. It's just a fact of life. So one of the things that happened for me recently was I was working on a team where we started building an application when React was still in its class components phase. Hooks hadn't come out yet. So we went with whatever was the latest version at the time of Create React app. But I don't know, a year after we had started, Hooks was released and kind of the the whole paradigm shifted of how React is should be written, how it should be built, all the things that go into running an application successfully. And that's when it starts to get tricky of like, how do you decide what is the thing that you need to do first? You know, do you upgrade everything and just rewrite the whole thing in hooks, which probably is not going to go very well. Your product manager is probably not just going to say, <laughs> okay, we're going to shut down for six weeks. You guys rewrite everything and then we'll start adding new features back for our users. Or <laughs> that feature thing was a joke. We don't need any of those. Right. Yeah. No, no, no issues until that happens. <laughs> or the approach that we ended up taking was a much more modest one where we upgraded the version of React that we were running on. And then as we were building new features, we started building them using functional components. And as we were going back to to add on to existing application functionality, we would maybe take the time to refactor that component that started out its life as a class-based component into a functional component. But that's kind of like the first bit of advice that I would give for anybody who is in a situation like this is don't feel like you have to do everything all at once because it's probably not going to happen that way. Yeah, I feel like yeah. it's... I, the scenario you describe really hits home and resonates with me as well, because I've went through the same sort of experience. I, I almost feel like it's a developer rite of passage to go to like your first tech conference and hear about all the new fancy things that people are doing. And then going back to your app that's been around for four, five, <laughs> 20 years, you know, whatever, and realizing <laughs> like getting a little bit demoralized at first, like, oh, crap, I, I really can't do any of this. And I, I also like how you describe it too, of like, there's extremes here. There's, you know, there's one camp where you could say, well, okay, well, oh, we'll just stick with whatever technology we were using, whatever, and just keep doing it. It's not worth the effort to rewrite. Let's focus instead on delivering features that it, there's problems with that. But then there's also problems with if you're constantly working on rewriting things, then you're never shipping anything useful to your users because your users don't care what version of React you're using and whether you're using hooks or class components. They just want features and stuff that actually happens in your app. So I feel like this is a skill you kind of learn over time of trying to find where your app is on that line, but like how how uh, aggressive you need to be about keeping it up to date and just 
strategies for doing that because the truth is React is a framework that's used for big, important things. And big, important things tend to stick around for a long time. So I think that these strategies are something that's super important to a whole lot of people. I think you also need to negotiate with your product manager, you know, some time for tech debt, just continuously, you know, whether that's 20% or whatever, you know, when you write code, the moment that you write it, it is, it's rotting, you know, and that's a really weird feeling, but it is, you know, because I, I mean, I, I wrote a resume in create react app two years ago or so. I picked it up again a year later and tried to upgrade stuff. And I was like, Oh my God. And just a year, <laughs> it, had, it had really rotted, you know? And, and I'm like, the, but this was absolutely current code a year ago. What a, you know, it's crazy. Yeah. Well, and some things too are really, cause one thing I'd like to discuss too, are things that are easier to upgrade and harder to upgrade, because I feel like there's certain things that if they affect the whole app, like sometimes just bumping up your react version or some dependency that touches everything can be hard because to truly test that, you kind of need to hit everything in your app, right? Because React sort of drives everything you do. And so you can't really know if it works unless you, you sort of change everything. But there are certain other things that are like, you really like a lot of the game here is to isolate the things that you're doing to make upgrading more of a, a slow process or just something more manageable and testable as you go. Well, and I think that that's, that's a great segue into another piece of the upgrade puzzle that people fail to talk about or really discuss very much, which is the stuff around your app that makes it good. Things like, do you have linting set up? Do you have code formatting set up? Do you have testing set up? And those things too will rot if you just set it and forget it and never revisit any of that stuff. Like I was recently looking at something and there's a whole bunch of new stuff in ES Lint that all these new packages that you can add and these new just one liners that make it so easy to set up like the Airbnb configuration, which is one of the still one of the gold standards for writing React applications. You just add like a couple of simple packages and lines to your ES Lint file and all those rules that you used to have to set by hand they're gone. They're just defaults. Yeah. And I had no idea that that was there because I haven't touched an ESLint file in like a year and a half or two years. But there's all kinds of improvements that come with time also if you take the time to revisit it and, you know, see what's what's changed since you last touched that file. I think this is why you hear so many senior engineers when folks talk about, oh, we'll just create a package in-house to go and do this or that other thing. And it's like, there are like 15 packages already in NPM to do this. And you're like, no, because it all rots. Like the moment that you write that package, I get that it's like five lines of code, but at the same time, you know, it's got to be up to date. You got to keep it up to date with package JSON and all the versions and all the ES lint rules and all the rest of it. It just, just let the concentrate on your, what you bring as a unique value, right. And, and spend your time and the, the bit rot management on, on that, as opposed to on these kind of things that a lot of other folks have done. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of different strategies for, for doing this. And, I know one I've done, and Paige, I think you had something similar at Home Depot, is we, back when I worked in big insurance, we used to, we had a wiki that was just like internal documentation. And we used to keep a list of like things we had decided on as a group for ways we want to write our code, but things we know we can't just make a sweep through the code base and say, okay, we don't have the time or it's just maybe not a good idea in general to switch everything from, you know, way A to way B. But we've decided as a group, this is the way we want to move forward. So if you're doing something like if you have a change, like a, a feature request comes up and, hey, you're going to be in that page working on it. Well, these are this is the, the wiki page you go to. You make sure you do these things while you're in here because, you know, this is something that's going to get tested and go through QA. So it's a great time to to upgrade those. So I, I know that strategy, it's it's a little bit manual. I mean, some of that you can verify with tools like ESLint, but you're somewhat reliant on a wiki. But I know I found it to work pretty well. Like it's a great code review thing too, because you can just, anytime you go through a code review, you can say, okay, this code changed. Let me make sure the the, the upgrade tasks, whatever they are, were, were done in here. I think that's a great way to approach it. And I love that you have kind of a checklist of things that you can say, okay, did I do X, Y, and Z? You know, is the 
functionality still the same? Do the unit tests pass? Do, do my end to end tests still work? That stuff is, that's a, that's a great way to have a real strategy for doing an upgrade instead of just kind of willy nilly. Oh my God, we all, we all upgraded to the new version. We've got to do everything all at once. And that's, that's one of the things that I really like about React because I came from previously an Angular JS background, which if anybody is familiar with Angular, the first version, it didn't play well with any of the subsequent Angular versions that came out. There really was no <laughs> upgrade path from yeah. JS to anything. So I really, I liked that about React was that you could be pretty confident that your class components would play nice with your functional components and your unit testing that started off using just an enzyme would not collide with your unit testing that started using React testing library and Jest as those became the new kind of de facto cu- power couple. So yeah, it's it, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing kind of thing. It can be an incremental, as I get to this again, as I take another pass around it, let me just do some refactoring while I'm here kind of thing with React applications. Yeah, and it has to be prioritized, just like the backlog, just like the regular product backlog. And if you don't have unit tests, as an example, right, that's the number one thing you got to get. Because if you don't have unit tests, you can't safely refactor anything. Mm -hmm. Because you don't know what the correct behavior is, and it's not tested. So obviously, that needs to go up to number one, and then you kind of roll back from there. uh, In terms of good code base hygiene, really, honestly, that's what it comes down to is, is just good code base hygiene. I'll say too, like the the flip side of this is, it's there's there's almost an art to knowing when it is a good idea to upgrade to some of these patterns and some of these libraries and when not to. So I've been around enough long enough to see like different technologies to go through different hype cycles. So for example, I remember when CoffeeScript was huge and you'd go to conferences and hey, I like CoffeeScript. <laughs> CoffeeScript doing well. And like you get tempted and I got tempted at the time to say like, well, screw it. I'm going to devote, I'm going to set a month aside and convert all of our code to CoffeeScript. And like not, you know, knowing years later that CoffeeScript kind of, I mean, it's still supported, I believe, but it certainly hasn't taken off and It's not something that people are looking for on your resume anymore. (laughs) No. (laughs) And to counter that, you have something like TypeScript, which started with the same height cycle, but has proven or has like survived the test of time a little bit better. Like now it's pretty confident. Okay, this is something that's proven itself. It's around to stay a little bit more. And so gauging that early on is sometimes hard. And usually, if you're on a big, important app, you want to be a little bit more on the conservative side and not jump on a trendy thing unless it's delivering some real value for you. Like if if whatever it is, CoffeeScript or whatever, you you're, you try it and it's like, oh, this makes our app 20% faster and us way more efficient, then great. But if it's just like a different syntax for solving the same problem maybe hold off for a while to make sure it's something stable and something that developers are going to want to see and use before you willy nilly go and change your entire code base over. Yeah, you need to evaluate everything with a very ruthless eye, especially if it's a new NPM package that you're adding. And Mm. even more so if it's an experimental feature that you want to turn on and use in production. If you're in React and you're like, oh, suspense is coming, it's going to be great. Let's just (laughs) flip the switch right now. That is really probably not going to come back to that's going to come back to haunt you. That is probably not the best decision you could make. Yeah, it applies to all levels of the stack as well, because I remember back when I back in my Java days, when I did Java, I went to a Java conference and Groovy at the time, who knows how many people will recognize that was like the hip new thing in the the Java world, because it was like a it was like Java plus plus and did all these things. And of course, like I was young at the time, I drank the Kool-Aid. I was like, oh, man, Groovy's Groovy's the future. And <laughs> I was frustrated because I could never bring Groovy into anything we did in big enterprise land. But turns out that almost certainly would have been the wrong decision because Java eventually caught up and like took the best parts of Groovy and incorporated it right in. And Groovy be- being like a branch thing was less supported over time and so that's something like with experience like again like i my instinct as an unexperienced person was like to just jump on that latest and greatest thing when Mm -hmm. really like i probably should have been more pragmatic but 
it, it's hard though because like obviously if we knew what the future was then this would make things it would make everything a lot easier <laughs> right well our 401ks would be so much bigger <laughs> yeah, but, exactly. um, <laughs> so I, I did a video a couple weeks back on, on programmer fights and one of the biggest programmer fights i think comes from this which is somebody gets really like you see this youtube video and you're like man groovy yeah oh this is the best thing ever right and you bring it in and then people are like hmm uh not you know you didn't get the reaction that you wanted like you thought the team was really gonna dig it and they and they didn't do it dig it and i think it's actually at that point you got to realize that like you are in a company right and you have to make money and yeah you know you can't be at the cutting edge of everything and if you want to go and do that kind of stuff maybe it is something you want to do at home you know on your own time and you just have to think about it from the business perspective like what's the return on investment how many people actually know groovy you know yada 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 i'm not going to bag on groovy too much actually we use it in ci cd systems but whatever <laughs> it was, it's fine <laughs> yeah i think it found its niche every every language eventually except coffee strip finds its niche <laughs> i think coffee strip is probably dead well and if you're lucky enough to work for a company that's large enough to have these sorts of issues and problems where you have very long running applications hopefully you're also in an organization that is going to kind of give you some roadmaps for how what are the recommended tools and languages and versions of particular things that you should be using like where i used to work at home depot we had the recommended version of if you were building an angular application try to start with four or eight you know as the base level that you were working with or if you were using Jenkins as your build pipeline, have a, a particular version or above. Or if you were doing unit testing, go with Jest and React testing library where we don't really want to deal with Enzyme anymore. So stuff like that, roadmaps or recommendations or even just talking to other teams in your org or other people who have been doing whatever it is that you're trying to do longer is usually a good, a really good place to start. Like, how did they do it? How did they overcome? Because, yeah, we're building unique things, but we're, we're really not reinventing the wheel as much as we like to think that we are sometimes. Everybody has to deal with authentication and logins, and they're all awful and very terrible and just hard to write. And permissions are really hard. But a bunch of people have already done this and solved it. So let's, you know, Let's lean into that instead of just trying to go and figure it out on your own again. Yeah. And if you're on that, if you're on the checkout team, do check out. Right? <laughs> don't don't hassle the people that are doing the CI CD thing and they're setting up all these scripts for you and they're maintaining that because they're doing you a, a, a solid, honestly, right? You don't want to deal with that. You want to do checkout, right? So don't don't get in there and say, like, oh, we're gonna go and own, you know, the CI CD flow. Because that's just extra work on you. Yeah, I can say as someone who's moved to a startup recently and doesn't have a full team to, to take care of all my CICD problems, I can say that it's nice to have that sort of, <laughs> it's easy mm -hmm. to rip on that sort of structure when sometimes they get in your way. But having another team that's uh, responsible for some of those those jobs is definitely not a bad thing. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Absolutely. I totally feel you. But then again, I mean, nowadays, there's there's companies, there's Circle CI, there's there's a lot of like off the shelf tooling. And that yeah, and you got to do, do the same thing there is, is get the best use you can out of those tools. And if they, and if they want you to do one thing, and that's going to be the easy path, take the easy path, you know, <laughs> take the easy path. Yeah, unless you have a really compelling reason not to, right? Like you, you right. should be able yeah. to very a business critical, really, reason. really justify it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We are all special snowflakes, but we're really not as special as we <laughs> like to think sometimes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if we focus on the the modernizing aspect, because I feel like we, I, I'm, I'm sure we have a lot of listeners that are working on these like big React type applications. I guess what other tips do we have for people, like whether they're their strategies or different ways of approaching it or with, like tips for working in a team? What, what else do we have to recommend? Well, I think Jack brought up a really good point, which is you need to be working with your product manager on this because they're going to be a lot of times the gatekeepers for what stories get put into your backlog and how, how prioritized things are or not. So being able to 
communicate with them the benefits that will come from doing things like refactoring or upgrading as kind of a, an ongoing process, maybe every quarter or every six months or something like that, being able to communicate why that will bring value not only to the the development team, which it will just because you're getting to stay up to date and current with what's what's going on in the industry and keep your app running smoothly, but also the benefits that it can bring to users, which a lot of times can be faster delivery of features. You know, if you're keeping up with what's happening, the all these frameworks are moving forward in ways that make it easier for us to get things done and get features built and get new cool stuff into production. So by keeping up with that and communicating that kind of value, there's a lot better chance that it will happen and that you'll be able to keep your application up to date and not have to fight the losing battle if we haven't upgraded this in three years. And it's going to be really hard to onboard anybody new to this team because they don't understand, you know, the very old syntax that we're using. It's very true that you know, we haven't gotten into this, but there is some importance of keeping things up to date from just a developer enjoyment. It's like a recruiting thing because you have someone that's interviewing for the job and like you can have the ability to say, hey, we're using the latest and greatest React. We're using hooks everywhere. We, you know, we're we using modern libraries and approaches. Th- those things do matter. I mean, those are the types of questions mm-hmm. I ask in, in interviews. So it's it's a really compelling, I mean, if you need, tips for selling this to your PM or your your business people like these are the sort of arguments you can bring up because it, they do matter. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. I want to go back to something Paige said actually a couple episodes ago for the eagle eyed eagle ear viewer <laughs> listener about re- using off the shelf component libraries like material. And, you know, I one thing you want to do over time is unsnowflakeify your app. You know, if, if for example, like when you were starting off your application, the company standard carousel for showing, you know, images wasn't available at that time. Right. So, but now it is, it's a year later, they've got you know, all, it's all a you know, alley. It's all, you know, accessible. It's all, all that. Take the time to remove that, that custom carousel code from your own code and bring in, you know, the company standard code. And if there, if you can finally move to something like material and get off of your own custom stuff, that's better. I mean, I honestly, some of the best times in my life when it comes to engineering and PRs are when the the PRs are mostly red, when I'm actually removing code and it feels so good because again, like we were talking about before, like the rotting thing, right? Code that isn't in the code base isn't code that's going to rot. Yeah. Yep. And you can extend that to like, don't parse your own dates. Don't, don't like, <laughs> Oh Lord. No. Like, <laughs> yeah. um, and I mean, we, we don't bring laugh moment. about this, There's but like, <laughs> I'm pretty confident all of us have worked for companies that absolutely do all of this in their code bases, <gasps> probably mm-hmm. in multiple, multiple locations. So oh, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's a good tip, but like, it really is a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, use those resources. You know, Lodash is a fantastic utility library. Mm-hmm. I would never write my own, pretty much any of the things that Lodash can do, I would never write my own because Lodash does it so much better. It is it is the most battle-tested utility library I've ever seen for JavaScript, and it's just fantastic. And the same thing for component libraries. Like, when my application was starting out, the one that I was working on at the Home Depot, we had no component library. We we hand rolled everything. It was was fragile. It was kind of flaky. You never you hoped that it would work, but you weren't quite sure how it did work. And then Ant Design and Material UI became the two big choices for teams. And when we went in there with Ant Design and suddenly were able to remove these hand-coded drawers that we had built or these tables that we had constructed. I mean, the amount of code that came out and the yeah. the stability that those things brought in because they were so much better written than what we yeah. could have done and maintained on our own. It was like night and day. And man, it made everything so much easier. I can't even express how good of a decision that was to, to standardize like that. Well, and, and the documentation's there. It's so good. Yes. Yeah, the, like you don't have to write your own documentation. Somebody else, right. somebody else does it for you. 
And, yeah. you know, historically, I think one of the arguments against that in sort of the front end world was all about just file size, right? Like, I, I mean, it used to be the era of you tried to avoid any sort of external libraries because they would add X number of kilobytes to your app. But I feel like we've gotten to the point where a libraries are more cognizant of that. So like a lot of them are very, very modular. They're, they're written in a way that they can be code splitted. So the, like, the foot the the impact on your footprint is fairly minimal and yeah. i'd say also like honestly even if your app is going to take a small hit in terms of its you know, low times or whatever that lots of times that's worth it because there's a real cost associated with your team's productivity how fast you can do things and so it might even be worth taking a small performance hit if it makes your team ship things faster because at the end of the day, you'll end up building a better app for your users. Yeah, I think there's a fantastic article that I read a long time ago about how given readability versus performance, the guy would 100% every time take a function that was twice, you know, it was half as fast, but was written in a way where he could actually maintain it and understand it and read it versus a one-liner that was like just, cryptic, but also crazy fast. <laughs> I know we've talked about nested ternaries before on this show. Oh. And <laughs> while they are <laughs> wonderful in what they can do, trying to understand them is damn near impossible if you weren't the one that wrote it. And you probably two weeks later, you won't understand it anyway. So that is, that's exactly, there is such a case for that. Readability is really important in that regard. Are you ready for core web vitals? Fortunately, Raygun can help. These modern performance metrics play an important role in determining the health of your website, which is why Raygun has baked them directly into their real user monitoring tools. Now you can see your core web vital scores are trending across your entire website in real time and drill into individual pages to focus your efforts on the biggest performance gains. Unlike traditional tools, Raygun surfaces real user data, not synthetic, giving you greater insights and control. Filter your score by time frame, browser, device, geolocation, whatever matters to you most. And what makes Raygun truly unique is the level of detail they provide so you can take action. Quickly identify and resolve front-end performance issues with full waterfall breakdowns, user session data, instance-level diagnostics of every page request, and a whole lot more. Visit Raygun.com today and take control of your core web vitals. Plans start from as little as $8 per month. That's Raygun.com for your free 14-day trial. I feel the same way about like method chaining, you know, where you get the dot foo dot bar dot baz. Every single method is returning this. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what happens if like halfway through that it breaks? Like how, wh oh, wait, what? I mean, again, I'm basically going to have to like split the thing in half, have, you know, create a temporary variable just to hold that half and then, you know, pipe it through the next half. And, oh, terrifying. I mean, I love the chaining stuff when it works, but if it's like <laughs> six or 10, you know, items after a row, it's like, nah, nah, that's nah. I feel like that's one that's thing crazy. we've sort of sold our soul with when it comes to a lot of front end stuff, because now lots of times when we have to debug, it used to be back in the day, something went wrong in the web and it would say, oh, something went wrong in this JavaScript file on this line. And it was at least relatively obvious. Now it's React caught it in its rendering process. So you're in some oh, Lord. five levels of functions that are yeah. might as well have been written in a different language. And then Webpack... <laughs> Built all, that, it, so built all that, built all that. Then you have levels of your stack trace is like literally sometimes 30, 40 levels <laughs> deep of nonsense that oh. you have no idea what it's what it's doing. So there's there's like a there's there's always trade offs in all of software development because obviously React and Webpack provide immense value. So we've as a collective <laughs> group sort of decided that's worth it for most apps because it makes dealing with complexity better, but it's those trade offs are always in place anytime you decide on any dependency. Yeah, and that's an important thing to keep in mind. You know, there comes a point where your code base is such spaghetti, that you're probably better off just blowing it up and building something completely from scratch than you are trying to continue to, to add on to this Frankenstein because uh, <laughs> my my team had reached that point when we started when we actually switched to React, we had an Angular JS application that was never really supposed to be in production the way it was built. It was built as a proof of concept, and the business oh, oh no, the business loved it. They were like, "This is exactly what we needed to do." Now, can did. you can you add these other fifteen functionalities to it? And it just mushroomed from there and got out of control in I don't know two years time or something. 
And by the time we decided that there was that we needed to do something, it was, you know, it was too late. We had to, we were going to have to upgrade to either a new version of Angular, which I think was like Angular 4 at that point, or go with a completely different framework. And because the the trade-offs were the same pretty much in terms of level of effort, we're, we just went with React because it seemed to offer a much better chance of backward and forward compatibility than Angular did. <laughs> but, you know, you, yeah, you Angular, do eventually... Angular really shot itself in the foot. Honestly, yeah, you will eventually like reach that terrible. point. And sometimes you just need to be honest about what's going to take us longer to try and continue to work on this thing and find people yeah. who know how to work with it or to just start over with something fresh. Yeah, I think some bit of good news is I think frameworks and I think Angular might have started this, well, because of their sort of upgrade fiasco is that front end libraries are very sort of aware that it's hard for people to upgrade. So like even the most recent React release, a big component of it was just making the upgrade process easier because frameworks know that people are building really big, important things on there. And they they are taking efforts now to not break things, which is always much appreciated. But hopefully it'll make it easier for those of you out there that do need to upgrade big things. Because I feel like the those sort of framework wide ones are the hardest ones to make because mm. it's one thing to upgrade like you know, small little components of your app, but anytime you need to upgrade something that affects the entire app, those, those were always the trickier ones for me to do. Absolutely. There's just so much more that could go wrong and so many potential errors and edge cases, I guess, to try and, and test for that. Yeah. Like we recently did an upgrade at our current company to a new version of next and everything seemed fine. And now there's like this one little bug where a code block isn't rendering correctly in the browser. And it's just like, you don't catch that until it's in production. And luckily, it's not like a mission critical error. But it's still something that we have to go and figure out how does this how does this work now? And why is it not working the way it used to? Yeah, and then yeah. go and figure out if there's any other examples of that literature yeah. the code base that are also gotchas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that's for even a pretty, in the grand scheme of things, small scale compared to what a lot of people are out there building. Oh, yeah, by far, by far. So going along those lines, what are some pieces of advice that I guess you would have for how to stay up to date with, you know, kind of the supporting libraries that you might be using? Like, If you're using a design system library and Material comes out with a new version, do you immediately go for it? Do you wait? Do you do you just keep going with what you've got until Material's like, okay, we're not going to support that one any longer? What is your kind of stance for for those extra libraries that help make your app as good as it can be? So one strategy I know I've done in the past is to try to batch those for like your big dependencies in your app because. Lots of times things like that require basically all parts of your app to be touched, like either with code changes or just like under the hood, something's going to be different on all of these pages. So if you build into your whatever cadence you use, like this every so often, we're going to bump up our dependencies and test it. I like the idea of testing like or just upgrading everything you can (laughs) essentially at once. Because you're yeah. you're gonna be like like obviously there's exceptions to that like if one of the libraries you're using had like a major like breaking changes or something like that then that's gonna be an exception but I feel like most of the time now library upgrades are relatively simple but it's like the thing you're worried about is the things that aren't obvious the things that are subtly breaking and so because of that I like just well when you're upgrading React upgrade your component library and your design language and some of your utilities. And some of the like underlying things like your Webpack version and stuff like that all at once, because you you might as well, because then at least when you're testing things, yes, it, incre- it increases like the surface area of things that could go wrong. But at the same time, you sort of knock it all out uh, at the same time versus trying to stagger these things and constantly 
being testing everything. Yeah, Dependabot is really good. For <laughs> I was this just thing. thinking about oh, Dependabot. Yeah, page, uh, like, yeah, it's Dependabot. Okay. I hate Dependabot oh, so yeah. much. It's good, but it's oh, also You bad. either love it or you hate it. <laughs> I know, I know. Everybody's got this semi-abusive relationship with Dependabot. But yeah, I mean, if you have your, if you have your unit test, and particularly your E2E test game, Pretty, pretty reasonably solid, I think. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Most of the dot upgrade, you know, the the minor version and patch, certainly patch versions, are usually really safe. I mean, they're kind of like fixing minor little issues, like edge, edge, the, the edgy, edgy, edge cases of the edge case kind of thing, right? That you probably never even got close to. Yeah, and it, if you're doing those minor upgrades, it'll make it. It's a far easier process than like if you wait and for like a year or two and then try to bump them up major versions because then the scope of what you're changing is now there's drastically more potential for problems <sighs> this is the exact same advice i give my daughter about cleaning her room it's like if you do a little <laughs> bit every day <laughs> it's gonna be that much better it's gonna be that much easier when you want to go and, but now she's got her own apartment so it's her was, problem so yeah <laughs> I was going to say, I'm guessing your strategy with your daughter is about as successful as it works in like software <laughs> teams as well. Like, <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that I wanted to, to note, which has been, it's been becoming easier, I will say, in the last couple of years is the old software developer meme of it works on my machine. I don't know why it's broken on yours or it's broken in dev or it's broken in production. And that is taking advantage of some of the new configuration and tooling that's come out. Things like NVM, things like just including your node engines in your package JSON to kind of specify this is the bare minimum version of node that we're developing on, or this is the latest, the bare minimum for yarn or for NPM or a, a new tool that I came across pretty recently. And I think you actually had the, the creator on your show, um, your react Wednesday's show, TJ uh, for Volta, which is this mm. awesome, awesome tool chain Thing. I don't even know how to describe it exactly, but basically you install it locally on your computer. You add a couple of lines of configuration to your package JSON that includes Volta, and you can then specify exactly what the versions of Node and Yarn and NPM or whatever it is that you use. And when you open that up in VS Code or whatever IDE, it will automatically switch your terminal to that particular version. And you don't even have to think about it, which is amazing. Yeah, nice. it's it basically it's a way of enforcing node NPM, like a lot of these like more environmental tools, because most of the day, most of the time, at least in companies I've worked for, like, you're setting all that up on your own, your, your node installation, you're sort of responsible for an NPM and yarn or whatever else you're using. And there's definitely some potential for like, I, I've seen these like subtle bugs between node versions, because it can affect how Webpack runs or how, you know, how your app gets built. And it can, those are also the absolute worst things to debug in the entire world too, because <laughs> they're not going to give you a clean, nice air that points you in the right direction. You're, you're going to come to that conclusion after a, a long, hard day or week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A couple of things that help with that. One is Docker. Yes. Docker. Use Docker because Docker is going to absolutely constrain all of that stuff for you, right? And then you can also use Docker for dev, right? If you have a Docker image that has your node version and everything else, and you basically just mount your source code directory into the Docker image and you're running everything out of the Docker image, and VS Code actually makes this there's some tooling in there that makes it really easy to do this, then you've got everything synchronized. So you're using exactly the same copy of node, or not copy, but version of node that everyone else is. And, and that's great. And the second point I've just forgotten. So yay. Okay. Yeah, but Docker. <laughs> Docker's great. Let's just do Docker. Docker yeah, is magic. <laughs> oh, Docker's awesome. It was interesting because I've, I've always been, I've used Docker before for like deployments and such, but I've always been hesitant to use it locally just because... I mean, Docker is fantastic. I've never, I haven't used it regularly for local development either. Oh, but I have experienced the pain that is mismatched versions of Node. Mm. One, one great example that comes to mind was when my team and I were developing, we were using, I don't know, Node 9 or something for an old application. And we did a deployment after hours as we 
normally did. And the the build pipeline, I think, was using Node 6. And of course, the app would not start up. That was just way too old for what our application was. And it was it was just a disaster of a night. We had to roll back the deployment. We had to debug the whole thing for a couple of days afterwards to figure out what went wrong. But that kind of thing is exactly what Volta and Docker and NVM and basically all these new newer configuration things are meant to prevent is those kinds of just everything's going fine, everything looks good, staging is great, and then you try and deploy to production and production just does not want to start. Yeah. So actually, I, I now remember what I was thinking about, which was, you know, keep those PRs and those updates really small. And the reason that that helps is, so you were saying, you know, you had this issue with this code block that didn't render, right? So you're not going to find that right away. You're going to find that six days from now, you know, that kind of thing, right? And you're going to have had 25 PRs between the one that actually broke it and the one where you actually found it, right? And so being able to do like a binary search really easily, particularly if you've got Docker images for each and every one of those those PRs, which you might have in some systems, you can actually just do a binary search. Like, oh, wait, oh, is the code block rendering in this one? Cool. It is. Great. Okay, roll it back here. Cool. Then look at it there. And you can do it, you know, you can find it pretty quickly. And if you got a nice PR that's like, oh, well, I, I see. It was. It came up with the next JS rev. Then at least you know that, right? That you got that much information about, okay, cool. It's the, it's the next JS the issue. Let's go and try and figure out what that was. Yeah, and I was... I think any CI CD process can help with this tremendously because exactly what you said, like if you had a good CI process that puts each of those deployments out there, you can just go sequentially see like, okay, where, where did this go wrong? And it can make your life a lot easier than trying to replicate that all locally. Right. Yeah. Or if you have, or if you got one massive PR, you did everything in, then that's you know, which, which part of this broke it. You know, or is it some, you know, kind of summation of these three disparate parts or whatever? Yeah. And it's like, it's also when you say massive PR, that just makes me think of some of the ones that I've had to review that are, you know, when you see that there's 150 files that have been touched, nobody wants to review that PR. Don't be that person on the team <laughs> who touches every possible file or like reformats everything in one go with a command and then expect somebody to be okay on your team with reviewing that. I get fatigued after like five or 10 files. I don't want to have to keep clicking and going through that on GitHub. It's just, it's not nice for anybody to have to deal with. And you're, like you said, you're opening yourself up to a lot more potential bugs and just uncaught stuff, the more changes you make in one big sweeping movement. Yeah. And if you've got those Docker images, like as you're saying, your night of terror, right? <laughs> At least you know that you can just roll. Okay. Whoops. Bang. Let's roll back to this version. Cool. Good to go. And as long as they haven't like messed with some microservice API in the meantime, you're probably going to be okay. If it was just a couple of days ago, you're probably not going to, you know, let's roll back. And now we can all go to sleep think about it and then wake up in the morning and try and come up with what the solution was. <laughs> and somebody, somebody will hit up Slack at like 5 a.m. and be like, oh, I know what it was. It was, we upgraded, you know, Lodash or whatever. Right. Not yeah. that that would break anything. <laughs> I love those, those developer stories that I would hear from the more senior developers on my team, though, where they'd tell me how the old style of doing things was, where they'd be up all night for a deploy. They'd sleep in the office trying to debug something. And it's just like... We don't live in that world anymore. I know you think it's a badge of honor that you ne didn't go home for 24 hours. But to me, that just sounds like an awful way to live or do anything. <laughs> I never understood that, really. In, in, in particular, like, I know that this is totally tangential, but like, I don't know why doctors have this thing about like, long shifts. Like, I don't want a person doing surgery on my hand if they've been up for 48 hours. Thank you very much. You know, and I don't want somebody doing a surgery on my code base if they've been up for 48 hours, right? That's not that's not going to end well either. I want somebody who's tanned, rested, and ready to like look <laughs> at this and go, "Yeah, cool." Like, you know, I'm coming in off the sidelines. Wow, yeah, there's clearly that bug done. Yeah, done. You know, all right. So, what are we doing? Are we doing picks or are we, are we keeping on going here? Why don't we? So, I've had a lot of good tips today, and Paige, I know you have a, a special announcement, I guess, for us, sort of based off of these tips. 
Yeah, we had a lot to talk about. And a big part of that is because we as a collective have had a good amount of experience in doing these things. But a lot of developers who are either new to React or new to enterprise organizations might not. And one thing that always frustrated me as I was getting up to speed myself with React for the first time was that there wasn't a lot of advice out there where maybe you weren't using the latest and greatest that React had to offer. Because it seems like every tutorial today starts off with hooks. You know, you just download whatever create React app is the latest and you start there and it's great. You know, everything works, it compiles, it looks good, it's, it's modern. But that's not the reality for a lot of people, myself included. And so I wrote a course with a company called New Line, which does a lot of all sorts of full stack and very targeted courses for web developers. They have a really great one for D3 if you're interested in that. They have mm. full stack Angular. They just recently released one on design systems and how to build your own. So I wrote and a, a complete course on how to modernize an enterprise level React application, because there's a lot more to it, as you have just heard, than does my code work? And is it the latest and greatest? It, it covers things like tooling and configuration setups. It talks about things like how to take a class based component and translate it into a functional component that uses hooks. We get into writing custom hooks. We use context. We write unit tests with React testing library in Jest. We use Cypress for our end-to-end -end tests, and we test out some of the experimental features in Cypress, like Cypress Studio, where you click around in the DOM and you actually tell Cypress how you want it to test when it runs its own tests, which is really awesome and a huge Ooh, time dang, saver. good. It's yeah. it's very cool. And then we even I even had time to do a bonus module that takes our application and then inserts a design library into it. And then we we switch out components to use the design library's components instead of our custom components. So there's a whole lot to it and you know, I I'm, I'm really excited and I hope that people really find it useful. So You sold me. Yeah, I'm <laughs> in. I'm in. <laughs> going to say I'm excited because it's one thing to talk about these things on a podcast. And I think you can learn a lot from hearing this. But then I think people need to know what's the next steps, right? How to actually yeah. put these things into action. Because it's one thing to say like, oh, use use tools like this. And it's another thing to actually see you actually tell people exactly what tools and exactly how to implement them. Because I, I think, at least from my experience, that sort of like guided take through things is is pretty darn useful. So I'm excited. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty cool because I have an, I build an existing application that we start out with, which is a very outdated React application. And as the course progresses through, we incrementally upgrade everything. Nothing, pretty much nothing is the same by the time it's over, but it's still a fully functioning app. It's just now using the latest and greatest stuff that React has to offer. So it, it gives you, I think, a better understanding of how to take something that is not up to date and bring it into today's modern software standards, which I, to me is really valuable just because there aren't a whole lot of those kinds of, of courses or, or examples out there for anybody. And I think I get asked a lot about junior developers. How do I become a senior developer? How to become a lead developer? How to become a principal and an architect? And each one of those levels, it's just about your investment in the company and the code base and you're meant to grow as a steward of the code base right and understand the business realities and understand how the code is affecting the business and then what you're offering is essentially a, a roadmap of when you're asked like how would you prioritize this you're giving them basically the answers to that, which is, okay, you know, you need to get on this, you need to get unit tests going, da, da, da. and that is, that is how you move up that ladder. You know, it's not just about prowess of writing code and knowing, like, the, the latest and greatest, like, oh, wow, you know, React 18 is going to be able to do this, da, 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 right? That's cool, but like, as you say, most of these companies, they're not that up-to-date. And they're looking for you to realistically give them a an upgrade path for the code so that it doesn't rot, 
so that they can still hire people onto it. But at the same time, they're not you know, going and doing the latest and greatest thing just because you want to do the latest and greatest thing. Yeah. And that's that's my hope with this course is that by the end of it, you'll feel confident whatever project you're put on or task that you're given that involves some sort of a React code base, you'll be able to navigate it. You'll be able to understand what's happening And you'll be able to eventually leave it better than when you found it, which I think is the goal for most developers is to improve their code in whatever way that might be. Whether it's camping or coding, you want to leave it better than you found it. (laughs) Exactly. Where do I sign up, Paige? I'm sold. (laughs) Where does my credit card go? (laughs) <laughs> I will definitely have links, but if you want to, if you want to go to newline.co and if you just search for modernizing enterprise apps or modernizing React, you should be able to find it. But we'll have links oh, to all of that in the out. show notes. Awesome! Yes, yeah. cool. that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Is it time also, for but, yeah, Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, congrats, for six. I know, like there, there are a lot of videos in here. Just scrolling through the page, so I know. This was not a small time investment. <laughs> yep. There's 54 videos. There's 10 and a half hours worth of content because I recorded a video for every single lesson. There's 10 modules yeah. chock full of good stuff. So go go check it out. <laughs> wow. <Yes>. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, Jack okay. and I both do video in some capacity. So we, <laughs> we, we understand the gravity of what you just said. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, we, from, from a little perspective, most of the time it's like a you know, three to one compression. So for that 10 hours of video, Paige ha- probably had 30 hours behind the mic and in front of the camera of, you know, typing all this out for you. And, and yeah, and that's not even counting like it. prep time, too. And then, and then edit, oh, right. Yeah, significant. Exactly. So. Yeah. I mean, she has to structure the course, get it all laid out. I mean, it, that is not a trivial piece of investment. Yeah, there's probably a, at this point about eight to nine months worth of time that it took me from the word go to the point of actually launching this. So it's been a labor of love and I am excited to finally see it release into the world and have people start getting value out of it. That's awesome. All right. All right. So on to picks. Hey, folks, it's Charles Maxwood, and I just wanted to jump in here and let you know about something that I'm doing. It's free. It's out there just to help you get answers to your questions about the things that you're running into with your career. So if you have questions about how to get further ahead in your career, how to start a podcast, how to get a better job, how to get a raise, how to deal with a situation at work with your boss, or just maybe you're stuck and you don't know where to go next. You know, how do I get from junior to senior, senior to whatever's next? How do I become a speaker? How do I get to the next level? That's what I'm out here to do. So every Wednesday at 12 o'clock mountain time, I'm going to be doing a call and it's going to be free, totally free. Go to devchat.tv slash level up and you can register for the call. It's using Zoom's webinar software. So it's pretty straightforward. And what we're going to be doing is I'll do 10 minutes and I'll just show you how I do some form of how I level up. And then we'll just answer questions. And it's not going to be a question and answer like, hey, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? And then I say Rocky Road or whatever, right? Instead, what we're looking for is more along the lines of, yeah, I have the situation how do I handle it? I'm trying to figure this thing out. How do I figure it out? I'm trying to stay current. How do I stay current? And if you have any of those kinds of questions, I'll bring you on the call. We'll ask some deeper questions. We'll make sure we get you a solid answer. And I'm really looking forward to helping some people out. There will be no sales, no selling, no nothing on these calls. It is literally just 10 minutes of training and then Q&A. So you can go check it out at devchat.tv slash level up. So Paige, would you like to kick us off with your pick this week? Sure, I would be happy to kick us off. So my pick for this week is going to be, oh, uh, a show that my husband and I have been watching on Netflix, which has been really enjoyable, very lighthearted, which is a change from some of the more gritty stuff that we've been watching lately. Mm -hmm. But it's a show that's called Nailed It. I don't know if either of you have had the the pleasure of watching that no i have not no <laughs> so is it nailed- the woodworking competition no it's uh it's oh, okay. a baking competition but um... everybody who's on it is 
not just an amateur, but not very good baking amateur. So they'll give them an example of some really gorgeous, you know, cupcakes to make or this really intricate cake to recreate. And they give them a ridiculously short amount of time and just see what comes out the other end. (laughs) And I can honestly say that my husband laughs so hard at some of the recreations that people try to do of these just gorgeous, gorgeous desserts so hard that he can't breathe at at points so (laughs) (laughs) it's definitely it's really it's funny because the you know the hosts don't take it too seriously the guests are just trying to keep keep everything together and it's really it's a fun one to watch so i'm gonna say you know if you need some lighthearted something to watch nailed it is a a really good one (laughs) For a second there, I thought you were going to say Squid Game. I was like, I, it was like going to be like up to the line, like Squid. She's thinking Squid Game, and then I'm like, oh no, no. The moment you said lighthearted, I was like, okay, it's not Squid Game. No. All right, TJ, what do you got? I did finish. I, I picked Squid Game last week, and I finished it, and it was it was quite good. So I can I can really pick that for people that that haven't checked it out. For definitely not lighthearted though. Like uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you're looking for something uh, something that's feel good, uh, you probably want something else. But uh, uh, this week, I'm going to pick air quality sensors. So Hmm. we make one at Blue. So this is somewhat a shameless plug for our (laughs) air notes. But uh, I could also pick Purple Air as another company in this space. And they make air sensors as well. So I'll link to both of them. But I through like working with this, I've had one set up in my yard. And I've actually find it quite fascinating to see air quality like how it ebbs and flows and trying to figure out what influences it so if you're at all curious what air quality is like in your area i've also found that having one at your house is kind of nice because lots of times you won't match whatever just some generic map will show because it's highly dependent on your specific area uh, Hmm. just because of you know weather patterns and how certain pollution reaches your house so I found it very interesting. And so you might as well if you're because there are guidelines like I have used it for if air quality is really bad, I might choose that day to not go do something like rigorous exercise outside sort of thing. So you can actually make some decisions based off it as well. So I I found it kind of interesting. So that's my pick. Yeah. If you live in anywhere west of the Rockies in the Mm -hmm. U.S., it's something you're going to take a lot of time and uh, think about because, boy, the forest fires. Ooh. It, the air quality is just it's terrible like oh, yep yeah and when the sky is orange it's 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 surreal yeah all right well my pick this week uh was raya and the last dragon it's a little bit older but wow we just watched it just recently and oh my gosh like the last uh you know 20 minutes of that movie i couldn't stop crying it was so <laughs> good and it just and it and it's really speaks to where we are is a society right now around kind of like looking past the differences and trying to come together. And I think, it, you know, it's a really good message and I think it'd be good for people to kind of embrace that message. And yeah, just, just, just look past the differences and give people some, give a you know, break and, and be nicer to each other and all that good stuff. I feel like nice. it's not that old, right? It was, that's, that's like, I think it was last year, year two, maybe this one, yeah. maybe year and a half. Yeah. I don't know. It's Aquafina. <laughs> She's in everything nowadays. She is. Yeah. yeah. I love her. And Nora from Queens is awesome. Uh, and, and, <laughs> the last Marvel movie and everything else she's in, but it's like everywhere I go now, it's Aquafina. (laughs) She's having a moment. She really is, but I think it's great. All right. Well, this has been awesome. And yeah, I'm I'm super excited about your upcoming courses came out. That's awesome. Okay. Thank you. I'm really, I'm excited too. I'm really happy that it's almost done and out and go subscribe to new line or go buy it individually. I'll love you forever (laughs) for it. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you all for listening, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. See you later. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.